introduce our speaker and and then uh, wrap things up after uh, after David's talk. Unmute yourself, Elizabeth. That uh, thing that's saying that the meeting was going to be recorded. I kept hitting got it and it kept ignoring me. Uh, but before I introduce David, um, there's an, a final comment here from uh, Colin and Stephanie. It says, I think our obligation with, with respect to medical exemptions is just to accommodate the disability. I think allowing participation by Zoom, et cetera, is probably sufficient accommodation. So what he's saying is we can let them participate by Zoom, but not in person. Is that what you're saying, Colin? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think we have to allow unvaccinated or unmasked people to come to the meeting. If they have a bona fide medical exemption, then we have to accommodate that. But that doesn't mean letting them come to the meeting. I think okay, yeah, sufficient I accommodation is allowing them to participate, um, you know, visually, virtually. virtually. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, that, that's a small point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Darren, Colin. Um, okay. So tonight's speaker, David Hoare, no stranger to most of us. Uh, He's a director at large on our executive committee. Um, he's along with his wife, Noreen Rudd, he's also an active member of the Delta Nass Casual Birding Group. And he's been a member of the Virgin Biodiversity Committee for some time and has been the lead on two of the brochures, the Flowering Plants of Delta that we've already had published and the Woodland Plants, which I think is getting pretty close. I think the last time David mentioned it, it was the layout was going to layout. So we should be seeing that one soon as well. Uh, David's a retired molecular geneticist who served on the faculty of the University of Toronto, the University of Calgary and UBC during his working career as a research scientist, teacher and consultant. His research interests were in, in endogenous viruses, DNA gen genetic diagnosis, forensic DNA identification, and most recently as a consultant in tissue matching for the VC transplant program. So a very, very interesting career. Uh, since retirement in 1991, uh, David and Noreen uh, mostly spent the summers exploring the BC and Alaska coast by boat. Uh, in winter, they prefer to travel to warmer climates, but they have braved the Arctic and the Antarctic as well. And their adventures are mostly, were mostly on underwater life, but now it's more about water on land or water wildlife that's on land rather than under the water and particularly birds. Um, the presentation that David's going to do tonight, um, Micronesian Islands Chuk Toponope, which I managed to spell in two different ways <laughs> in every different place, <laughs> but it's pronounced Ponope. <laughs> It's based on a trip that he and Noreen made many years ago. And at that time he was doing DNA studies of peoples of remote populations. And he'd collected uh, from the inhabitants of Vanuatu um, to the south of Micronesia and was negotiating with a local physician to obtain samples from Punapi, Punapi natives. Um, the necessary approvals didn't go through uh, before they got there. So he wasn't able to do that but they did manage to have an absolutely wonderful trip. Anyway, uh, they did um, live on a boat for 10 days, um, a charter boat, and did many dives on World War II wrecks in the Truk Lagoon, which is now known as Juke. <laughs> I think Dave is going to explain about some of these name changes. <laughs> and uh, then they traveled east to Orluk, which has a population of five people. <laughs> And then on to, um, to, pop to the Atoll of Ant, which has a population of zero. <laughs> and they ended up in front of me, which has an amazing and architectural, pardon me, I can't talk tonight, sorry, I'm tired. An amazing and fascinating archeological ruin 
that he thinks should be considered one of the wonders of the world. So his presentation tonight is gonna to show this trip and its amazing sights both beneath the tropical seas and on the islands. So I'll turn it over to David, who I'm sure will be able to talk much better than I can tonight. <laughs> Thanks, David. I unmute myself and we can we can start. And Jim, do you have it so that I can do screen sharing? Is Jim there because- uh, Okay, you should be good to go. Okay. Okay. Just have to bear with me for one minute while I get this set up because I see something different from what you see. That looks pretty good. And I need to do this so that I have a pointer. And then I'm set. Looks good. One second. Okay. I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, just a sec. There's something funny going on. Somehow I'm getting other people instead of the speaker's view. That's right. This, this is a trip that we did back in, 90, in 1988. And so that's 33 years ago. So I'm digging in pockets in my memory. And as some people say, sometimes they're cul-de-sacs and I lose little bits of information, but I tried to uh, fortify those missing parts with uh, a, a virtual tour of Micronesia using what exists today. In other words, there's an awful lot of stuff online if you want to go to Micronesia. Unfortunately, at the moment it's closed because of COVID, but there are a lot of people there that are waiting for tourists to arrive because um, some of these areas are very dependent on tourism. So back in November, actually it was late October 98, Nareen and I drove from Calgary to Vancouver, uh, stayed overnight and then joined a group of 18 people. Well, we were two, so we grow, joined a group of 16. And... Uh, um, they were from the Vancouver Aquarium and included Marie Newman and Kathy Newman, his wife. Um, so that, that uh, we could head for, for um, Hawaii as a first stop. And so I'll, get, I'll start there. Now, just one second. Okay. okay. I've got to resize my window, unfortunately. Come on. You're changing size. I know. Okay. Maybe that'll work. Okay, we arrived in Hawaii. Um, usual flight, Vancouver, Hawaii. And I think at that time it was Canadian Pacific and uh, stayed overnight there. And the next morning we caught a Continental Airlines flight, which is a junket across the Pacific. And um, to give you some idea, we stopped in Johnson Island. And I don't know if anybody knows anything about Johnson Island, but it was the US military storage place for things like sarin gas, Agent Orange, all those mustard gases and toxic gases that the military had. It was their stockpile and we were not allowed out of the aircraft. And in fact, they said, don't take any pictures. Um, very closed area. But by 2004, I believe most of those chemicals had been destroyed. And the way they destroyed them is they burned them. And so there was a plume of smoke blowing to the west of Johnson Island as these 
toxic chemicals and um, nerve gases and what were destroyed. However, we didn't experience any of that. We just experienced the fact that we were not uh, welcome on the island and nobody is really welcome on the island uh, other than military personnel involved. Today, it's the US Forest Service, I believe, that looks after the island and the main occupants are, I gather, frigate birds and a few other species of birds and a small group of, uh, of research scientists. So from Johnson Island, we flew to Majuro, then Kwajalein, and Kwajalein we picked up two more passengers and on to Kosre, Ponape, and we stopped and truck. And by that time, I think it was just, uh, sun was setting and we landed on the, um, the runway, which is at the edge of the island. Now, to give you some idea about the Federated States of Micronesia, this is a collection of, uh, of over 600 islands scattered around. Most of them are atolls, not all of them, but a good number of them are atolls. And most of you probably remember that atolls are formed by sea mounts that um, penetrate the surface, develop a fringe reef around them, and then start sinking back in as the top erodes away. So there are uh, often these atolls are left with a, a small number of islands in the middle or portions uh, of the island in the middle with a barrier reef around the outside. And the barrier reef continues to grow and, and build up and that becomes the atoll community, which is often a large lagoon uh, associated with it. And then it'll have islands along the edge of the barrier reef. So there are four different um, provinces, I guess, in, in the Federated States of Micronesia and the Caroline Islands. Yap to the far east, Chuk, Ponape, and Kauserai. Yeah, I, I, I have to remember that Chuk is not truck, but I will make that mistake many times. So relative position, Hawaii 4,000 kilometers back from where we came, Australia almost 3,000 kilometers to the south, Japan over 3,000 kilometers to the north uh, east, sorry, northwest. So in the middle of nowhere, beautiful area. A little bit about its history. The first people to, uh, first Westerners, I guess, to arrive in these islands were in fact, the Portuguese, and then the Spanish um, took over from the Portuguese. And at the end of the Spanish-American War, uh, Spain had to give up its territories, which included the Philippines and uh, Puerto Rico, and I think uh, Guam and a few other places like that, which were in Spanish hands. Some were given to the US and the Spanish were able to sell off the islands of Micronesia to the Germans. Germans held them through until the Japanese Navy invaded at, in the First World War and took over occupation. That land then was under the League of Nations control. They developed or, or designated the South Seas Mandate and gave control of that to Japan. And it remained in Japanese hands until the second, the end of the Second World War, and um, became a trust territory under NATO, and, and that in itself was um, put under American control. They received their independence in 1979. I have here, and Noreen reminded me that it was, I think it was 1982, was it? 86. Or 86, that uh, they were fully independent. But I pointed out to her something I read recently says that they still receive close to 1 billion US dollars annually, which is a big part of what keeps the Federated States of Micronesia still, uh, still functioning. So this is a, a look at a, a map and you see that all these islands lie just north of the equator and to the west of the Marshall Islands, which includes Bikini Atoll where the atomic blasts were done and Iwanak. Both of those were uh, atomic test sites. So 
the um, Micronesian islands were not used in those kind of tests, but the Micronesian islands were an important part of the South Pacific uh, War during the Second, the Second World War. It was strategically held by Japan. And at this point, I should remind you and myself to call it Chuk rather than truck. But as a, it's the same place. And, and when I was growing up um, and reading about the Second World War of the, in the Pacific region, it was always called truck. So it, it's something that comes off my tongue very easily. The other, not so much so, because it's a more recent. Um, and in fact, um, the change of the name to Chuk was after we had visited. It was still called truck when we were there. So we went to um, an island in the center of Truck Lagoon, which is the island is, and the uh, town is Weno. And in this satellite image, I think you can see in the upper left corner is the airstrip up here. And we landed on this airstrip, got off the plane, our luggage was thrown on carts. We were wheeled to the edge of the tarmac and climbed into boats. Um, little boats. And this was our hotel for the next two weeks. And on the right is Murray Newman. And the vessel is um, the Thorfinn. And this is a very recent picture of the Thorfinn. And I'll tell you a little bit of history about it because it's a, a very interesting vessel. Years ago, I worked off the west coast of Vancouver Island and they were still whaling on the west coast of Vancouver Island. These were the boats that were that had the harpoon mounted on the bow and were chasing whales. And we would see these boats out there off the west coast. The Thorfinn was one of those built in Norway, ice class whaler. Um, and at, I think about in the late seventies, Lance Higgs bought the vessel and had it converted to a charter vessel. And he had it uh, converted to a charter vessel for specifically for salmon fishing up the coast. But he didn't keep it that very long. In 1982, I believe it was, he headed for the South Pacific. And where he headed for specifically was Truck Lagoon. Now, Lance was a diver and was intrigued by the history of truck. And so headed that way. And truck is of historic interest to people who have read about the uh, Battle of the Pacific. On February 14th, uh, or February 17th, 1944, um, Operation Hailstone took place. And it was really three carrier groups, I believe it was, that approached the, the island of truck and um, launched an attack on the Japanese forces that were in Truck Lagoon. It had been their headquarters, but I think it was a week or so before that, the Americans had flown over with uh, some large aircraft, um, I guess doing reconnaissance. And the Japanese had seen these reconnaissance aircraft and presumed they were going to be attacked. So they set up high level defenses which they continued for about two weeks and then they got tired of it and stopped and had a big party and the neck on shore and that night uh, or the following morning after the party was when the Americans arrived um, with the sun and sunk a large number of vessels. I think um, the 450 attacking planes and around 50 vessels were sunk in the first day. Some of them took a couple of days to sink. Other ones escaped and sunk in the deeper ocean. Um, and this is the area that Cousteau did a big um, underwater video on called the Lagoon of Lost Ships. So this is where we went to explore. So some wrecks have been more recently discovered, um, probably in the last 10 years. With side scan sonar, you can see a lot more than you used to be able to see. And so they're finding wrecks, but then 
you have to go often a lot deeper to see some of these. Oops. This is a photo taken from the old Japanese um, headquarters area. The building actually became a Jesuit school. And so this was actually a school grounds. And we're looking out across some of the other islands within Truck Lagoon. If you go to the islands, um, I think there are four different airstrips in, in truck and various on various of the islands. One island was essentially made into an airstrip. Um, but you'll see caves, um, tunnels, um, fortifications of various type. On the upper left of this photograph is a lighthouse. And if you go to this area of Micronesia and you're interested in birding, I dug this little piece of information out of one of the recent um, tourist information brochures. So there are about 200 species or so of birds found in Micronesia. I don't know what number would actually be found in truck alone, but if you went amongst the islands, that's probably what you're going to run into. And it says that the Chuck Greater White High lives in the mountains of Toll, and I'll show you where Toll is. So if we look down in this lower part, Toll is probably one of the higher islands. Anyway, this is the area where the White High would be. But we had landed in, in Weno and the airport area, and these little dive flags uh, signify some of the wrecks, not nearly all of them. So Truck Lagoon is about 65 kilometers across. It's huge. You can't see from one side to the other, obviously, in this, this thing. But it's a very sheltered area. And because of that um, surrounding barrier reef, which is almost complete, there are a few gaps in it. it um, is a pocket of water that doesn't get an awful lot of circulation. It gets ample uh, aeration, why not, and lots of nutrition, but uh, it doesn't have a lot of circulation. So that if you, if you think about circulation in tropical waters, circulation cools the water. So truck was not cool, and I'll tell you about that. This uh, on the right is um, a group getting ready to go diving on one of the skiffs. And you can see these are open air skiffs, and I'll explain why that makes a difference. Nowadays, these are probably 20 foot skiffs. The ones they use now are in the 30 foot range. They're pontoon boats and they have a cover. So you're not sitting in the sun all day. So before we went diving on the, on the first day, we were uh, given the rules. And the rules were maximum depth, 40 meters, which is just over 100 feet, maybe 100. 10, 115 feet. We had to return to the surface with 500 pounds per square inch minimum. Now, the, the tanks that we started with were around 3,000, 3,200 pounds, 72 cubic foot tanks. And when you came up to the surface, you were supposed to have 500 pounds left. So you didn't suck your tank dry. There was a compulsory 10 minute decompression stop at 15 feet. And the reason for that was a, a safety stop as, a, as we call it in diving. And they would hang a, a bar over the side of the boat down at 15 feet. So the first thing you would see is the bar as you're coming towards the surface, you'd stop at the bar. And if you had overdone it on your air, there was always a spare tank tied to the bar so that you could, um, grab air from an extra tank if that was necessary in order to, to finish your decompression. They did not want you to shoot right to the surface. That was quite clear. And the reason for that is the bends, obviously. So these are the, the skiff heading out for a dive. And um, the sites, you can see, I, I'm not sure exactly where we were anchored, not far from the airport, but uh, in a sheltered spot. And most of Truck Lagoon is fairly sheltered. The weather was very settled. Um, I think we didn't see rain the whole time we were in truck. Um, and I've marked two vessels, the Yamagiri Maru up here, and I'll show you some of that, and the Fujikawa Maru down here, two different um, dive sites. The Yamagiri Maru, um, you can see the information. It's about 100 feet down. That's the, the bottom of it. It's a huge wreck. Um, 
four, 439 feet, tipped slightly on its side. And uh, you could see into the holds and, and various things. Lots of rigging still standing on this. And when you first hit the water and looked into it, the thing that was really quite amazing about it is you'd see things like this and you'd say, wow. And what this would be is an eight inch steel mast completely encrusted with soft corals, huge soft corals, maybe six or eight feet in diameter of corals, some crusted corals, but also lots of soft fronds like this. Yeah. And that's marine uh, and probably in maybe 20, 30 feet of water. And you never know what you're going to see when you're diving. And uh, maybe she's bug-eyed because of what <laughs> showed up behind her. <laughs> and this is a little further down on the on the wrecked hulls themselves, and you see what we call um, rust flowers, huge amounts of rust built up on these hulls. Now, if you think about it, this was 1988. That is 44 years after these vessels were sunk. Now, we were warned that some of the old vessels with wooden partitions in them were becoming a little bit dangerous. The steel wrecks, not so much so, but, but the wooden wrecks are ones with wooden partitions. And uh, one dive master said he got pinned by wreckage that came down and trapped him, and he had to have somebody help him get out. So you want to be careful if you're penetrating the hulls. And Noreen said to me that she didn't particularly want to go in. And I'm... I particularly like photographing small things, so I was quite happy to photograph all the marine life that existed around the outside of the wrecks. But we did look in, and these are some uh, military ordnance. These shells were massive, absolutely massive, and I've guesstimated about 14 inch by 40 inch, and they're not dead. They were alive. And the question is, did water get into them or not? Well, the time we were diving in Truk, the, um, we would occasionally feel, actually feel underwater, a thump or hear a clump. And what it was, the locals were finding these munitions, not in the deep wrecks, but in shallow ones, and using them to detonate on the reef and kill reef fish who would float to the surface and then they'd collect them. And they were doing a lot of reef, um, damaging a lot of reef corals. And uh, there was an effort to try and stop that. And I think it, it, has, it has stopped some time ago, but at that time it was still going on. So you could say these were dangerous uh, objects and, and true they were, we weren't about to touch them. At the end of a, a dive, you headed to the surface. And as I said, you stop on the decompression um, safety stop and then hit the surface. And when Noreen hit the surface, um, everybody was in the boat. In fact, Noreen and I were a little puzzled when we were sitting on the decompression bar, there was nobody around. Anyway, she hits the surface and the dive master got in her face and said, you were supposed to come up with 500 pounds of air and Noreen picked up depth gauge and showed it to him and it was 900 pounds. And he did a double take. And I came up and I got the same gears and I had the same 900 or 1,000 pounds. So that raises a very interesting point. And I'll say it to anybody who is not a diver. If you're very relaxed in the environment, it's very comfortable. There's nothing to it. I mean, you roll off the boat into the water the temperature was 91 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not cold water. And the temperature at 100 feet was still 91 degrees Fahrenheit. It was just like being in a bathtub. Absolutely amazing. And the visibility was such that if you put your face down in this water with a, with a face mask and looked in the water and you're in 100 feet of water, you could see objects on the bottom. In fact, one of the divers dropped a camera the previous day and didn't realize he dropped it. It slipped off a clip on his belt. We went back to find it and we found it from the surface looking with our masks and then went down to get it. So uh, quite amazing place to actually do some diving. Well, the new dive rules, they changed. 
and I uh, bring it to your attention because of uh, what I'd said before. Down at the bottom, you see David and Noreen had a maximum bottom time of 40 minutes. So we had to be on the decompression part by 40 minutes. One of the other wrecks that we dove, and we dove a lot of different ones, and I can't remember all of them. I, I have pictures that remind me of specific ones. Um, the Fujikawa Maru. This is a picture of her early in 1944 before she was first torpedoed by uh, an American submarine and then towed to Truck Lagoon and repaired and was in Truck Lagoon, um, probably ready to move again when the um, Operation Hailstone hit and it was then sunk good once and for all. This ship was built in 1938, fairly new, a passenger a cargo vessel. And the um, Japanese Navy um, commandeered it, I guess, and turned it into an aircraft transport vessel. So in the forward, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a look at what a diagram of this looks like. This is a nice diagram when you're going diving on these wrecks. And there weren't these kind of diagrams for the wrecks. I found this recent one because it actually was very informative because we saw all this stuff, but we didn't have this information going into the water. We just had to explore. And um, you'll see the guns on the bow and stern, the pilot house. Um, I'll draw your attention up front. It says zero airplane wings and cockpits down in, in hole two. We went and sat in the cockpit of a of a zero fighter. Um, and you'll see this torpedo hole at 105 feet. Well, Noreen said she'd never go in Iraq. Well, the dive master came by and took her by the arm and led her into the wreck. Through that hole. Through that hole. <laughs> and I followed. Because, <laughs> of course, I'm the one with the camera. <laughs> These are just some shots taken around there on the far left. You can see a diver and one of the uh, guns on the, I can't remember, bow or stern. The, the one on the, on the right down here is actually another one of the guns loaded with soft pearls. So it's in shallower water where the soft pearls are more likely to grow and proliferate. Up on this one, you'll see some pink sponges on the ladders and all sorts of crusty coral and rust and everything. Uh, an old ship's lantern here. And in the middle is a mooring buoy because if you keep dropping anchors around these wrecks, you're gonna destroy them and you're gonna cause a lot of damage. So uh, it didn't take very many years before they put in mooring buoys so that now you go to a mooring buoy on a particular wreck. That's another way of limiting the number of divers on a wreck because when we went, there were 20 of us basically, plus dive masters. And when you put that many people in the water swimming around a wreck, each time you flip your flippers, you stir up a little bit of muck. And so the visibility gradually diminishes. You get a lot of backscatter if you're using a flash underwater and you don't get the kind of clear pictures you get in, in uh, open areas. So this is a torpedo hole through the bottom of, the, of this uh, Fujikawa Maru. We entered and um, the dive master took us into the back and reached behind a partition and brought out with him a porcelain goblet, which he wanted the two of us to link our arms and, and pretend we were drinking from, which we did. But then I got him to do it with Noreen so I could take a picture. And then he put it back and hit it. And I gathered there are several things that the dive masters have stashed in various wrecks for, to show to, to visitors. This is, um, looking in the wheelhouse of the boat, looking out and on the lower right is, is a telegraph on the stern for um, maneuvering purposes. So there's a lot of very interesting things to see. Um, another wreck that we didn't dive on, and the reason we didn't dive on it is it was a little deep um, beyond the depth that the group of divers I was with were qualified for. We were a bunch of aquarium members, and even though I'd previously done a lot of deep water diving, um, there weren't enough people in the group to make it worth 
setting up these deeper sites. So the, the San Francisco Maru was, was another one of these wrecks. And I found it interesting because on its deck, there are three of these little tanks, cute little things, but uh, very destructive militarily. Um, it's probably about 160 feet, 180 feet in that, in that range. Then after diving, of course, you want to get the body temperature up because even if the water temperature is 90 degrees, we were doing two or three dives a day, even at that temperature, you lose core body temperature. And so a hot tub was just a wonderful place to jack the temperature back up to the normal range. This is heading out of um, Truck Lagoon going through one of the the gaps or Chuk Lagoon heading out through one of the gaps heading for Orlok. Now Orlok is a small atoll and, and as Elizabeth said, population five and it's about 400 miles and about, I, I believe about 20 hours steaming to get there. So we left late in the day after doing our dives and overnight and then at some time in the morning we got into Orlok anchored offshore and um, it has a fairly shallow lagoon but it does have some deep water channels and it's at one it was at one time a german uh, coconut plantation and they were going to the, the locals the five locals one of which was a child an infant actually three women and one guy and um, they were they were putting on a pig roast for us and I didn't take a picture beforehand. This is the aftermath after everybody had had a feast or f feed. And um, on the left is Murray with one of the, the woven, it, it's coconut fronds and cowrie shell weaving that the women do. And that's one of the women in the upper right with Noreen. And um, this pig roast was absolutely amazing. I, I mean, uh, surprised me because you had a mouthful of pork and it tasted like what? It's, you, it, it is what you, you are what you eat because it tastes like coconut. There's no question. It had that real sweet coconut flavor. Absolutely amazing. Well, there's nothing on this island except coconut ponds, uh, palms and coconuts. And they, they produce copra and ship it, which is used for making coconut oil and uh, various other products. Um, and they feed their pigs, and the pigs taste like coconut. Amazing. Then we did some some deep dives. Um, you of course see different things when you go deep and you go in into the channels where the food is moving, and of course the predators move in because they like the food, and. You keep an eye on them. And if you look carefully, they're little guys. And that's the one thing I like is I like the little guys and you have to look closely because they're buried down in the, in the uh, arms and tentacles of, of um, an anemone like this little clownfish or these guys, which were in that poster that uh, Elizabeth put together. There are many different species of clownfish, by the way. Um, I couldn't tell you the number, but uh, they're all cute and if you find a nice anemone, you'll usually find a clownfish or a family clownfish in the area. This is a um, lionfish, which were in the shallows. We also go to the shallow lagoon and this was in the shallows. And I don't know whether any of you realize that this has, has been an important part of the pet trade over the years, but it's now a pest in the Caribbean because they have been released from people's collections in the Caribbean. And the local fish in the Caribbean have no idea what this thing is. And it's got toxic spines and it, and it will uh, kill them. So it's turned out to be a real pest and the numbers are, are really quite substantial. I, I was absolutely staggered by that. And that's happened in the last about 20 years. If you go down and you look in the, in the cubby holes or holes in the coral and reefs, you'll find such as big eyed squirrel fish here and all sorts of soft corals in the in the upper left here is a, is a feather duster worm and it's about the size of 
a tuning and it pulls itself into a hard calcareous tube if you disturb it. So if you, as you get close with your camera, obviously they, they just shoot back into the tube and you can't get their picture. So it's a, it's a challenge to approach them without uh, disturbing the water in the area. Upper left damselfish. And many of you probably have heard of crown of thorn starfish, which is in the lower part of this picture, just a part of one of the arms. They come in a variety of colors. This is a, a yellowy green one. They prey on coral. They actually go over the coral and eat the coral polyps right out of the coral. At one time, they were thought to be responsible for the bleached white corals on the Great Barrier Reef, and they were doing a, uh, an eradication program. But um, obviously, global warming is a better explanation for what was going on. What was happening was the environment was changing, and of course, the starfish were taking advantage of changing environment. The fish in the upper left, I have no idea what it is. I, I would have asked Murray Newman at the time, but I can't remember. The butterfly fish in the, in the lower left, uh, if I were in Hawaii, I'd call it a triangle butterfly fish, but it's got a black face, which the triangle butterfly fish doesn't have. So it's a tropical butterfly fish um, in some part of Oraluk Lagoon. And there's a big fish on the, on the right taking pictures. Um, sea fan or gorgonium, lots of them in certain areas. They, they like to be in areas where there's current. And so you see them waving in the current. Very interesting and, and can be very colorful as well. And this little, little guy became big. It was a little puffer fish. And I think I probably caught it, which is probably not the nicest thing to do. Had it by the tail. And of course, it fills itself with water and becomes a balloon. I handed it to Noreen so I could take a picture. He let him go and he deflates and he goes back and hides in the rocks. And there are other things like this Napoleon wrasse or bump-headed wrasse or hump-headed wrasse, different names for it. They're a, a huge fish. This one would probably weigh close to 400 pounds. It'd, be, it'd weigh twice as much as I did. Um, at the time we were in Oraluk, and that's a very remote area, we would see these in the channels uh, quite regularly. And we actually saw them on Ponape as well. Now they're red listed because they became a target of people, spearfishers or whatnot, because there's a lot of meat on one of these fish when you consider their size. But uh, they just move like a submarine. They're just so massive and, and just slowly move through the, the channels. Doesn't matter what the current's doing, they seem to be able to, to uh, keep their own. After Orlick, we went to the Atoll of Ant. And this is a lagoon, and it's probably only. Uh, Four, four hours or three hours uh, steaming out of, out of Ponop. But um, it has lots of hard corals in the, in the lagoon. The thing about a barrier reef is it depends on how deep the water inside the lagoon is and what the situation is in the outside of the lagoon, lagoon will govern what sort of growth that you get. A deep water lagoon, which is one that we could get in with the boat and anchor, it's deep enough for that. Um, there's probably a lot of water moving in and out of the channels and across the reef at various points. So um, you, you get different types of things. And, and the thing that I remember about Ant was, was the hard corals. So here's a picture taken of some of the corals. And I think this is probably a daytime picture, but we did night dives there as well. And um, you see totally different things at night than you see in the day. I mean, I should be able to tell you right now, there are butterfly fish in this picture. There's probably, this is probably a wrasse up here at the top. Um, I'm not sure what this one. No, it's not a squirrel fish. But anyway, this one is a butterfly fish. Um, those are daytime fish, they're not nighttime fish. The nighttime fish are quite different. You'll see the, some of the eels, the conger eels and various things like that at night. You'll see some of the, the things like the um, slipper crabs and various other things at night that you won't see in the daytime. And, and the other thing here is fire coral. And 
You may have heard of fire coral. The usual way you find about it, out about it is you lean on it by accident. And it's just like a branding iron. And it's caused by the polyps releasing uh, trichocysts, I think they're called. And um, you're getting stung. And um, it leaves a red scar just like a hot poker. So we wore uh, nylon jumpsuits when we were diving, but this stuff even go through the nylon jumpsuits. This is an elegant feather star, and these guys can swim. You don't often see them swimming, but you will occasionally as they move from one location to another, multi-arm stars. We have similar things here in BC, but uh, down there, inter interesting. Um, regal angelfish, again, a daylight, daytime fish. Um, really beautiful, and you see the, the colors of different sponges and, and various things around um, on, the, on the rocks and corals. It's actually not rock, it's all coral, I should say. And these are probably blue chromis, or in this picture, they look purple, and that's probably because this is a 30-year-old slide and they do lose color retention uh, over time. Um, flame angelfish, and this is staghorn coral. So from Ant, we headed towards Ponape. And um, this is the entrance to Ponape Harbor, and the, and the town in there is Colonia, I believe. And I want to just point out here, columnar basalt crystals. And I will tell you a little bit more of those later, but that's what that whole uh, mountain face is composed of. And here's where we can say Ponape spelled the way it was in the days when we went there which was P-O-N-A-P-E, but it is now called Pon de Pe. And the, the meaning of the word is a pon stone altar. So a pon is P-O-H-N, not P-H-O-N as, as we saw a few times, but uh, very easy to invert those. But it all sounds the same. And if you Google P-H-O-N or P-O-H-N, you go to the same place because there's no other choice. So I took this picture in the Queen Charlotte Islands of what's called pipe organ rock. And it's just, uh, it's on the west side of, of the Queen Charlotte Islands, just north of Skidigat Narrows, um, maybe about one inlet north of Skidigat Narrows. And it's columnar basalt. Um, so these are again crystals. Now the size of the crystals is determined by the rate of cooling that happens at the time they're developed from uh, volcanic intrusions. And in Ponape, there was a lot of this columnar um, basalt uh, generated. And, and this cross, this map shows some areas that are cross-hatched. All those cross-hatched areas have some columnar basalt on them. And I'll draw your attention to Nan Madol down in the sand and Hemwin Island. Uh, I'll come back to that, but uh, one thing of interest is you don't see any cross-hatching of Temwin Island. You see some fairly close to it, but none right on Temwin Island itself. This is a view from our hotel. So we got off the boat in, in um, Ponape. And I think part of the reason that Lance was willing to do this trip from truck to Ponape was because he was going to get fuel. Now, he had a real deal going throughout the islands in the South Pacific. The islands in the South Pacific generate their energy from diesel electric. They don't have waterfalls. They don't have, at that time, they didn't have solar. There wasn't solar, um, didn't have wind. There was very little uh, production of electricity except by diesel electric or diesel generation. And diesel generators only run really well if you change the oil frequently enough. And when you change the oil, what do you do with the old oil? Well, you got to get rid of it. And these islands had a real problem with getting rid of old oil. Well, the Thorfinn is actually a steam-driven vessel with boilers. And the boilers run on any kind of burnable product. You probably burn coconut oil in it. 
it'll burn anything. And if you tune it up right, you don't make a lot of smoke. It's actually a pretty clean burn. And Lance was servicing the islands and also getting fuel for a dirt cheap price. And I think he figured that out before he went south because keeping a vessel like that running is not a cheap business. And he's still there today. And I saw pictures of him when I was looking things up for this test. He looks a little older than he did in some of the pictures that we, we took. So this is a village hotel, looks out over the water and all of the, the rooms are actually thatch huts. It was owned by an American couple. They ran it, and I think in 2004, they, they ran into problems with um, land ownership issues, which often happens in some of these places. Um, and they decided it wasn't worth the hassle. They were getting senior, and so they essentially sold the hotel and left. But they were a very gracious couple. They treated us well because Marie and Kathy Newman had been there before, so they knew uh, ahead of time that we were coming. Oh, one, one more thing I'll point out here, which, which intrigued me. If you look on the ceiling above the beds, there's actually two beds in this room and you see these drapes up above the bed. And I was curious, what were they there for? Well, the reason they're there is because if you didn't have them, there are so many geckos running around and they poop on the bedspreads and make a terrible mess, but they can't stick to these cloth stretched cloth um, drapes that they have on the ceiling. So they put these above all the beds to protect them from, from gecko poop. So this is where the village hotel is in the upper area of this, this um, map. And you'll see there are several passages through the reef. We dove several of these passages. I think we were four days in, in Ponape. And um, we would usually do one dive a day and then visit town or something else. And, uh, and this particular day, I think we went to the waterfall. Now that was nice to have a tropical, it's actually pretty warm water and um, a tropical setting to play in the waterfalls. We also, hitched into town and visited some of the craft industries. And Noreen is holding some uh, green peppercorns and the gals in the middle are packaging dried peppercorns, which of course are black. And they package them in these bamboo shoots as part of their, their trade. I gather a lot of it goes to Japan, but uh, we brought some back with this great black pepper. We also, <clears throat> were taken to a native village to uh, be exposed to some of the native culture. And in, in this particular uh, picture, you can see they're making kava. Well, one time when Noreen and I were hitching back to the village hotel, we got picked up by a bunch of kids. And uh, it, was, it was curious because the back of the truck was full of plants and uh, we asked them where they were going and they were going for a cava party. They were gonna have a cava party. Well, what in the, was in the back of the pickup truck was cava plants and they had the, the roots. So they were dug out by the roots and they had some hibiscus, um, large um, diameter hibiscus um, that they chopped down. And what they do is they pound the root with a mortar and like a mortar and pestle, but they just have these big rocks that they pounded on until it's a, a pulp. And then they put it in bark, in this um, hibiscus bark and wring it out. And the juice that comes out, this gal on the lower left side here has a leaf a frond that she's using to catch the dripping um, juice, I guess that is, has come from the root. And she's running it down into a, a coconut, half coconut shell as a cup. The other thing they did is they also uh, treated us to um, coconut milk and um, I guess you'd say coconut water, which is what most people know. Coconut water is a, is a very um, thin, uh, clear, slightly cloudy liquid, tastes refreshing, particularly if it's cold. But they also treated us to sprouted coconut uh, milk and it was, creamy and thick and very different from what you get in the uh, 
young coconut. So once the coconut has got to the stage where it's already starting to sprout and produce a, a, a branch or a, or a frond and a root, um, the whole flavor changes, the whole content changes. So Murray and I are enjoying one of the coconut drinks. And they also, um, at this Kava ceremony that we were invited to, um, there were a bunch of gals and guys who did native dancing. So it was, a, it was an interesting experience. I, I somehow don't think that today you will run into this, but in those, in those days, that was the way it was. So let's go on to Nan Madal, and I'm gonna finish up with Nan Madal. Nan Madal is, is what I call the most intriguing place that I have probably been in terms of where it is and what it is. On the right, you'll see these large um, columnar crystals, and these are basalt crystals, and they're just like logs, only they're a little heavier than a log. And this person standing down at the end, so you can see these are sizable. These happen to be roof structure beams from um, probably 1100 to 1500 AD, and they're still there, and they still have spaces down below that you can crawl into. So what do we know about Nanbadal? It was really um, it's the, the development of this major, uh, I guess, facility was as a, a shrine or a palace by two brothers who were sorcerers, I said, because they got um, dragons to fly these stones around the island and bring them to make these structures. And you can see this structure in, in the lower part is almost like log cabin stacking of of uh, pieces of basalt, all columnar basalt. And Nan Madal, um, there's some evidence of early building in the area around 500 AD, but the major uh, activity was in the time 1100 to 1600. I think it went to 1628 and it ended abruptly because the, the um, lineage that was in charge were oppressing the Ponapean locals. The two brothers from the, the dynasty, the, the witches or whatever they were, uh, wizards, um, were from a different culture and had arrived and they ran that island for the 500 years through various um, family groups. So this is a world heritage site, a very, a very impressive World Heritage Site when you start looking at it. There are prisons, there's all sorts of things. If you look at it <clears throat> with some people standing close to it, you see that some of these are really massive chunks of, of basalt. And if you ask the question, what do they weigh? Average five tons, large ones, 25 tons, some even 30 and, and more. And there were also rocks there that weighed 30 tons, like huge boulders which were part of the foundation for building this because it was built in the water and it was built up above the sea level. And this is a drone view of a today, uh, recent days, drone view of looking at uh, Nanbadal region. And you can see obviously evidence of walls here, but what all else is there that you didn't see? Well, I found a, a National Geographic reconstruction of the site. So this is twice the size of Vatican City. I mean, it's, it's not a tiny structure. And this is what it looked like by, I, I think they used X-ray technology to get rid of all the vegetation and put it together. And, and this is sort of the structure. And it was built on the edge of Temuan Island. This is the edge of Temuan Island. So all of it is built in the water. And as, as I showed you with the, the huge basalt columns, how did they move them? Fascinating. I'm, I'm not even sure they had the wheel, but uh, they probably had canoes to float them. But most of these came from some significant distance. And a group from New Zealand studied the X-ray diffraction characteristics of these, and they can look at the composition of these rocks and determine where they came from on the island. 
And so they were able to, to show that they came not all from close by, some came from quite distance. And it appears what they would do is essentially mine out all the easily accessible um, columnar basalt from a particular area and then move on to another area. So that's, that's our trip in a nutshell. Um, sorry, I took a little bit more of your time than I planned on, but uh, it's interesting. And I really got into doing this because I remembered much of the trip, but I knew that there was more to it and I needed to go back and refresh my mind and perhaps work on a coffee table book to remember some of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. I hope I'm my mute's off, I hope. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, just absolutely wonderful shots and so much history that I had no idea. I'm, my late husband would have known a lot more about that area in World War II because he was really into World War II. But, uh, you know, I, I tend to forget how much of the Pacific was involved in, in the war. So that part was really fascinating. The beautiful fish were lovely to see and the corals are just amazing. Um, I did want to ask one question. How many people lived on Pompeii when you were there? I think the population was around 25,000 if, if I remember correctly. Uh, I would have to go back and, and check, but most, um, a lot has changed in the islands. Um, as I said, a, a good part of their financial support comes from the US, but um, it's in most of these islands, I think through all the way to Palau, some of them have, uh, what do they call it? Um, essentially female centric society, the females own the land mm -hmm. and um, usually are the, the guys go and fish and collect the fish, they grow the taro root and, and produce the, the other half of, of the meal, so to speak. Is the population bigger now or smaller? It's larger. It's, it's, larger it's grown as most, as most places have. Yeah. See, Paul has his oh. hand there. Uh, excellent, David. I really enjoyed that. I'm also a bit of a history buff. Tell me, did you see any uh, human remains on those ships? Anything re resembling a human or remnants of? Well, there, there are lots, and most of the dive masters have hidden them. Um, if you go to uh, Truck Lagoon and look at the websites, you'll see lots of photographs of um, remains. The biggest group of travelers to the Chuk Lagoon nowadays, and even back in the days that we were there, are Japanese tourists, and a lot of them associated with the Second World War. And there was a, a huge effort made to recover the remains of any existing um, bodies and to, uh, I think, repatriate them, as I, as I seem to recall. But there, are, I know there still are um, hidden behind bulkheads and various things, and depends on who your dive master is, whether he'll show you a hidden treasure. Thank you very much. Oh, I see a very interesting comment here from Karen Topham. She's saying, I dove in Chuk on the 60th anniversary with a film crew from the History Channel, stunning corals and fish, and it would be interesting to share photos from 2004. Oh, so oh, fabulous. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, would you like to do that as a presentation, Karen? Or were you thinking just of sharing photos with David or <laughs> is she still there? Yes, no. I don't see her, no. Responded in her chat. Pardon? She responded in the chat. Oh, she, oh, she, yes, I see she has now. She could, they're all slides. Okay, so that would be that would be wonderful. So in the fall. There's somebody for. 
There's somebody for Elizabeth to add to her list of, of potential people to, Absolutely. to fill in the slots. Yeah, no, it would be, it'd be wonderful. There's a huge <laughs> Sounds really time has passed. OK, thank you, Karen. Uh, does anyone have questions? Not seeing too much in the chat here, so I will take a look. Molly? Um, are, were any of those coconut drinks alcoholic? <laughs> um, I would say no, but cava, which we were, we were treated with, uh, sure numbs your mouth. I'll tell you, you can't feel it after you had a few sips of that. It doesn't take very much. And I expect if you consumed much, and, and I guess I had a little reluctance because it just tasted like drinking dirt. <laughs> but your whole mouth went numb. <laughs> but happy dirt. <laughs> yeah, probably. So, do you think that any people were, were killed by those shells being exploded when they were setting them off to get fish? That is a horrible thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think a lot were over the years with, with munitions that have been left behind. Oh, and that's that's unfortunate, but um, yeah, I'm sure it happened. We didn't talk about it. No, we were, we were, don't imagine uh, it's something they really wanted to talk about. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure the local newspapers would cover that sort of thing um, <laughs> because you know it it, um, it was frowned on. It was not supposed to be done, but it was being done regularly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are people who still probably who still fish in a similar kind of way. <laughs> and obviously not supposed to, but no. okay. Does anyone else have more questions? Oh, Carol. Carol has Carol? a question. Yeah, I, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. That was totally fascinating. You know, that was actually so different from um, many of our presentations. And uh, it's an interesting experience for those of us who just swim on top of the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carol, it would be it would be nice to show you some of the videos that people put together, but probably the best one is is the, the lost ship or lagoon of lost ships that uh, Cousteau did many years ago. Mm. Um, really fabulous. Mm. Nowadays, the, the dive groups that go to truck, a lot of them are using exotic gases, able to do deeper dives uh, routinely. And uh, I know the Thorfinn handles mixed gas dives, um, rebreather diving, all sorts of things like that. But back in, in the... Um, early 80s or mid 80s, uh, it was still pretty basic diving. Uh, were you not afraid of the sharks in the water there? No, we've been diving with sharks many times and um, you just don't present them with an opportunity to take a bite. And ideally you don't have any bleeding wounds. That's really not a good idea when you run into sharks. I can remember being <laughs> or the Coral Sea, diving in the Coral Sea and there were sharks. And we, and there was a group of us and there were, um, we were backed against a, a reef outcrop and they brought some food down a, a clothesline from the boat where it was anchored to the bottom. And they'd shoot down this clothesline, um, fish, chunks of fish, um, scrap from the slaughterhouse or whatever from the fish processing plant. And of course, the moment that hits the fish, the big fish, like the sharks appear. And we were backed up against this coral wall. So you're pretty safe because they're not gonna come near you. But uh, there was a little gal from Richmond actually between Noreen and I. And all of a sudden she did a bug eyed look because this huge shark came right down between us. <laughs> and uh, headed for the food. But it had come in over our shoulder. It was a, a little bit of a surprise. However, they're, it, it usually they're after the, the food and um, 
as, as some people say, sharks aren't something to be really afraid of, but uh, you just don't want to present them with flopping arms off a surfboard or kicking legs in the surf and shiny, things like that. Shiny, shiny objects, you want to be something. Oh, there was a, car a cartoon of a diver and it was one shark talking to another saying that you're really, you're supposed to peel them before you eat them. And it was talking about eating a diver in a dive suit. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, thank you. Uh, anyone else have any more questions before we wrap up? That was a really fascinating presentation. I can just make a comment regarding sharks. Uh, we were in the Galapagos and these two sharks came charging towards me. I thought I was going to be attacked. And apparently they were pets of the, some of the divers there and they just were trained to do that. I certainly <laughs> added a little liquid to the water, I could tell you. <laughs> That's quite oh, amusing. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again, yeah. David. Hello, you're quite um, welcome. Next month's meeting um, is April 5th, and uh, Martin Gregus Jr. is going to be back with us again, and we're going to be back in the Pacific again, but in a whole different part of the Pacific. Uh, when David was talking about the distances between different island groups and, and different, you know, distance between the group in Australia, the group in Hawaii, I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of kilometers. Uh, Martin is going to be in French Polynesia, uh, which is kind of south of Hawaii by quite a few miles, I'd say. Um, he, he's actually working over there on a project called Before They Sink. So what I think what I'm assuming he's going to be talking about, because we haven't really discussed it too much. He was just starting the project uh, when I contacted him about this, but it's basically we're looking at islands under threat uh, from global warming and sea rise. So there'll probably be a little bit of similarity with uh, what we've seen tonight, but I think it'll be quite a different focus because he is looking at, uh, at the threat against these islands. So I think it'll be another really good presentation. Uh, Martin hasn't uh, disappointed us yet. <laughs> so I hope to see you all on April 5th. And um, as we discussed earlier, there will be something going out to all members very shortly asking for everybody's vote for different options for going forward with in-person meetings or hybrids or whatever. So 